All right, thank you all for coming today. And I just wanted to actually pose a question to kick off our question and answer session now. And I'll start off with actually one of my last comments. Uh, who here remembers when that Russian submarine placed a flag at the base of the Arctic Ocean? Okay. That's a sovereignty concern for the United States and for all the countries in that Arctic area. Any thoughts from anyone in the audience regarding uh, how they thought that had a place or an impact possibly on the future of America? Ma'am? Well, it would uh, restrict our ability to travel through those lanes. I mean, if, they're, if it's a sovereign country, would it not? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's a concern that the United States faced and uh, has been working with other countries in that region to just verify and solidify and ensure that we are all in an un appropriate understanding of exactly what is free and open and that we're all on the same lines of thought. Yes, question? Oh, I was just gonna, oh, uh, go ahead. the tremendous oil reserves under the area <clears throat> also kind of up for grabs. I think Russia making a grab at that <clears throat> affects the, the U.S.'s claim or potential future claims on it. Absolutely, there's a significant amount of potential oil reserves, manganese nodules, numerous resources that exist in that region that really are up for grabs. And they can have a significant impact on not just sovereignty concerns, but also economic concerns for all countries involved. And so, yes, as a country, we are very concerned about our sovereignty issues in that area. And one of the reasons I brought up the issue of the three Coast Guard cutters that are able to operate in that area is because we as a country, we don't have a lot of assets that operate in that area because that's not really where we work. We primarily work in those areas that Chris mentioned of the warmer parts of the climates of the world. And so we have to actually be prepared for the future. We've got to move forward and, and think out into the future, and our strategy helps us to get there. I just, uh, not to interrupt, uh, China's building a big navy. Is anybody worried about China? Okay, why? So your hands up. Why are you worried about China? Um, well, in the past, our, uh, or currently, uh, with our stance on Taiwan, mm -hmm. um, obviously it could be um, a potential danger if they do decide to invade Taiwan or attack Taiwan and we keep our current stance that we are going to defend them. Okay. Taiwan's an excellent point, and not only is Taiwan still sort of behind the scenes assiduously uh, asserting their you know, uh, not their democratic government, but their, at least their democratic ideals that clearly poses a problem. And I don't know if you've followed, but they almost monthly conduct military exercises to see if they can uh, defend against a Chinese amphibious invasion and the like. Who else has an issue with China? Who else believes that it's, yes, sir? Our competition for oil, which will increase, and the uh, free and open shipping lanes uh, for that oil. Absolutely, absolutely. And his oil clearly has no, as I uh, briefly touched on in the presentation, no necessary means of going away anytime soon. That's, of course, going to be important. Uh, who else has a concern or a, a comment about China and their navy and their military? Anybody? Okay. Go ahead, please. Are they even ever going to have the capabilities to make it as far as us? <laughs> Maybe. Um, depending on, it, that's one of those great questions because I, China's economy raise, uh, uh, is growing at the rate of, I think it's like 8 or 9% per year. We usually level at 3 or 4. If there's any economics majors that can embarrass me right now, please do. Okay, so I'll assume that that's the truth. 11, is it 11? Okay, China at 11. It's even worse. How long can you maintain an 11% per year growth? I mean, that's an astronomical number, notwithstanding the fact that their population is over a billion. Uh, 11% per year for a population of 250 people probably makes sense. Uh, for a billion, probably it peters out in some way. So to relate back to the military thing, they are developing a lot of submarines. They are developing, uh, they're talking about developing an aircraft carrier. It's possible. Um, the technological edge, probably not. Uh, you know, this is America. We get the best scientists. We get the math, uh, we get the best uh, engineers. But again, a lot of those folks are going to university in Asia. Uh, the number of math and science majors in Asia is uh, starting to rival ours. So it's possible. It's possible. Um, any other China comments before I uh, kick it off? I'm hogging the microphone. Yes, sir. Uh, kind of comment on, on not only just China, but also uh, the rest of the world. Territorial waters. China, I don't know if many people know this, but uh, China's territorial waters, they claim extend almost to the Philippines. 
Could you, could you help explain the Navy's role, the, the, Coast, the Coast Guard's role also, not only just with China, but also with, say, countries like Libya, in helping uh, constrain those territorial waters? Absolutely. And territorial waters, not to deflect too harshly, but John can probably speak better to that, and then I'll come back to it. Sure. I can just uh, address some of those issues. Regarding territorial waters throughout the world, obviously uh, we, as a country, uh, we recognize 12 nautical mile limit, which I'm sure you know quite well. And that's what we pretty much feel throughout the rest of the world. Um, and that's how, we, that's how we operate, and that's what we believe. But by working with countries such as China, you know, we recently pulled in two Coast Guard cutters into China last year. Um, those things help to impress upon these countries that we stop and saying, hey, we understand what you're saying, but understand what we're saying also. You know, and that also helps to open up those international dialogues, those talking and those discussions as part of the International Maritime Organization. Uh, many of you may have heard potentially of the Law of the Seas. And that's one of the things that's going on right now, and it's open actually for U.S. Uh, legislation concerns right now because the U.S. is one of the countries that has not ratified that treaty. But that will actually help to address some of those issues and those concerns, not only of the U.S., but also with countries such as China and other countries that have those territorial-based issues that we are concerned with. But, sir, also as a counter to what you just said, mm -hmm. uh, looking at what China did in November and for Thanksgiving, we had two ships return away in Hong Kong. Uh, that's obviously a step back for us. What, what, was, what was the result of that? And uh, was there increased dialogue that happened from there? Or? Well, I, I honestly can't speak on those two ships being turned away, uh, but you have to look at that, too, as that's where we also work as a cooperative group here. Those two ships that were turned away, if I'm correct, were U.S. Navy ships. The two ships that were allowed in were U.S. Coast Guard ships. Now, maybe they were turned away, but the next ships, maybe they'll be Coast Guard or maybe they'll be Navy, but we've been there. And we can get back there. You know, uh, it's, it's one step forward, maybe one step back, but we never go back as far as we've been before. Yeah. Can I raise a, can I raise a point, Lieutenant, on that issue? I was deeply involved in that issue, and that was a very troubling development uh, with our relationship with China. Um, in fact, it was more than two ships. Uh, it was the Kitty Hawk Battle Group that was about to enter um, Hong Kong. And um, I don't think I need a mic, thanks. Um, but um, what happened there was on the eve of Thanksgiving, you're exactly right, uh, we worried that this was probably a, a very deliberate decision in Beijing. Um, it was probably not the Chinese Navy that, that was making this decision. What was even more troubling than the Kitty Hawk Battle Group going into Hong Kong is we had two U.S. Navy minesweepers that were in close proximity to Hong Kong that were in very heavy weather. Um, not quite in extremis, but they were seeking safe harbor in Hong Kong, and the Chinese government denied their access entry as well. Um, we're not sure whether this was a purely calculated move. We're not sure if this was a misunderstanding that occurred uh, within the Chinese government, but I was very much impressed with how rapidly the U.S. government responded to this. Uh, I can tell you that I spent Thanksgiving Day on the phone with people in the White House, um, and I was very impressed that this could move up through our political government as quickly as it did to try to help us. But we're getting very mixed signals from China right now, and and on good days I'm encouraged, and on bad days I'm discouraged. So um, it's very insightful of you to ask that question. One other aspect about China, they are actively using soft power to gain influence themselves around the world. They're through humanitarian efforts, through uh, helping uh, developing countries build infrastructure, and so they're pursuing exactly what we're trying to pursue through the maritime strategy and our cooperation uh, efforts with other countries as well. So that's why it's so vitally critical that we establish partnerships with uh, nations around the world and gain their cooperation, their help in uh, patrolling the seas. Uh, we are there for the humanitarian uh, relief efforts and we're there as well because they're gaining a lot of influence around the world. And uh, as they do that, then these countries turn to them instead of the United States when they need, uh, they need help, as they have traditionally done. 
God, yes, what's the harm in Chinese uh, gaining influence? Why can't we work with them as opposed to seeing them as a uh, as a obstacle to their relations? Uh, we try as much as possible, and the Coast Guard does, I would say, at least from my perspective, a better job than the Navy does at cooperating nation to nation. Uh, John was talking about operations that their Coast Guards conduct with each other. It's a yin and a yang. Um, if you look back at Chinese history through thousands of years, um, there's a good and there's a bad to every decision that they make and that they do. Um, the right mix is to positively engage while still countering at the same time. You know, they turned away a battle group of ours. They turned away a couple of minesweepers that were just seeking safe harbor. While at the same time, all you hear about in the news is economic cooperation and the fact that uh, I'm from D.C., that Dulles Airport flies, you know, more nonstops to Beijing than any other, uh, any other airport uh, in the country. Here's the problem, though. While China has buttressed its rich and its growing oligarchy and, 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 you know, dozens of billionaires cropping up, the living standards for the vast majority of China are horrible. Uh, the government is not receptive to change or democracy. So while it's good to cooperate, we have to be sending some sorts of, di uh, of diplomatic signals to let them know that, you know, one – you can't hold that kind of a government forever. I mean, for anybody that's taken IR 101, you know that central planning and economics, uh, I'm sorry, central planning with government doesn't work with a free market economy and economics. Um, those two just kind of naturally conflict. So we try to do both. Did that answer? Did I? Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Why is that a Navy problem? <laughs> it's a Navy problem because when I go to sail around the world, when I was in the Persian Gulf and when my friends that were on the West Coast go to countries like Thailand and Bangladesh, that they are the face of the Navy. Um, this whole, the whole point of the strategy... That wasn't my question. My question is, why is the structure of the Chinese government? Oh. Yes, sir. Okay. It's not. It's not. However, we can do things to improve the relations between China and the United States with our Navy. I think that's the point I was trying to get across. But, but I think... It, it's, I'm sorry. It is an absolute problem. If their sure. government... Uh, it has something happened to it. There's a whole lot of ships and submarines uh, under someone else's control that we don't want to deal with. Sir, did you? But, but I think it is a Navy issue, not solely the Navy, but the Chinese government is electing to build a very big, very capable Navy. The largest submarine force in the world right now is the Chinese submarine force. So as we see the Chinese government take these actions, we're just curious to what end. Why are they building a navy that they now can move beyond the first and second island chain? Um, is that going to be a threat to us in the future? We hope not. We're not picking a fight. But that's a different question. You know, Chinese naval policy is different from the economic and political structure of China itself. Well, I mean, if you buy Friedman's argument, well, I think it's a powerful one, is that there's a relationship between the two, that, that you can't look at them in isolation. And we think the Chinese government understands that. We think, they, we think China gets George Friedman. Um, and so we think that the two are connected. Who controls the Panama Canal now? Who controls the Panama Canal in terms yeah, doesn't, of... Didn't the Chinese take over the operations of the Panama Canal? Day-to-day -day actual financial oper operations, excuse me, yes. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I, interestingly, I was able to uh, visit the Canal Zone about two years ago, and uh, the government of Panama actually controls the right. Canal Zone. Uh, the United States in the late 1990s uh, turned control of the Canal Zone back over to the government of Panama. Uh, and in, in it's, if you've never been down there, it is an absolutely extraordinary operation. To think that that was built in the early 1900s and still operates as well as it does today with as much commerce moving through it, and they are committed themselves to a multi-billion dollar capital investment to build a third set of locks to handle the larger class of tankers. Extraordinary. Mm -hmm. What you may be referring to is that the significant ports on either side of the canal zone on the Atlantic and the Pacific side, those port facilities are uh, heavily invested by uh, Chinese businesses. Um, and you could speculate why. Certainly, 
there's economic reasons to do that. Uh, there are some people that believe that they have an interest in controlling those those port facilities, if you will, not the canal itself, but the ports, because of their strategic importance. Um, I, I don't know. But they are they are very much engaged in that part of the, of the world uh, and, and have increased their engagement down there. But the, the canal zone is still, itself is still controlled by the Are we canal. as heavily engaged there as the Chinese now? Um, in the business sense, I, I don't know the exact dollar amounts, uh, but you know we still maintain considerable relations with the country. Uh, there's a we have a, a, a there's a lot of American businesses that still operate down there. Obviously, very maritime centric. Uh, there's still uh, a handful of governmental and a significant number of non-governmental organizations that operate down there. One place I visited, the Smithsonian Institute, has a maritime research facility they maintain down there. So there's we still maintain connections to the government. Um, economically, I'm not 100 percent sure who has the most investment down there, but I do know the Chinese investment is growing in that part of the world. Um, there's inter international relations scholars often posit that great, great power politics are driven by a dynamic called the security dilemma, whereby one nation's efforts to increase its, its security inherently threatens others simply because military power can always be used for offense. And so, um, in, in, with respect to China, what has been uh, the response? Uh, from that country to this strategy? Do they view it as seeing it as, as really a cooperative effort, or do they see it as sort of a hedging strategy where on the one hand we want to work together, on the other hand they see it as possibly creating an alliance to balance and contain China uh, within its sphere? I've seen, a, I've seen a number of translations of Chinese publications that came out very shortly after uh, we released the strategy. And the one thing that we can determine with real certainty, and there's not a whole lot that we can, but the one thing is that they are very excited that we refer to this world as a multipolar world. In other words, a world uh, in which there's, when you look at the, uh, uh, the Cold War, it was, it was two poles. It was us and, and, uh, and, the, and the Soviet Union. But the fact that we're referring to this world as multipolar really excites them. Uh, and we hope that gave them the incentive to cooperate. Um, recent actions haven't necessarily done that, but we're banking on a long-term strategy that that's what we're looking for. Uh, if I can. Sir. We spend a lot of time worrying about the sea lanes for control for uh, the safety of getting oil to us. Surely China has even more worry about that. So I don't know that you could just immediately assume that uh, you know they're developing such capabilities as innately hostile. Absolutely. I mean, and and as mentioned before, you know, navies ply the the world's oceans on a day to day basis not always with hostile intent. And China gets a lot more of its oil from the Middle East than we do. A lot more on the order of, I think, two to two and a half times what we, what we take from, uh, from the Middle East. I saw a hand over here, I'm sorry. Well, in, li in line with the, uh, the fact that there's a direct connection between economic growth or uh, the economy and, and uh, the military, the Chinese are bound to see it the same way as their economy grows too. So they have to be concerned about protecting protecting their shipping, uh, and uh, so it, I, I will say it's benign, but it may not necessarily be as offensive as uh, there's a tendency to worry about. I think that's true, and that's certainly our hope. Um, Admiral Mullen, who's now the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and I had the opportunity to meet with the head of the Chinese Navy, and that's his contention, is that, um, that, that the reason the Chinese government is building a bigger navy is because they understand the relationship between economic growth and the ability to to protect um, their sea lanes of commerce and and that's a very plausible commendable reason for building a navy um, but as the gentleman in the back said as security interests rise and as competition of resources also rise it is inevitably somebody can go for their gun and that's what we want to avoid in this maritime strategy, we want to elevate the notion of the prevention of war, um, not at the expense of winning war if we have to, but we'd prefer to avoid it in the first place. And we would welcome China to come along the same path. Um, I was just, uh, this may not be a, a real strategic concern, but more of a headline concern, but uh, the, the use of like smaller speedboats to try and uh, shake up the Navy like what's happening in Iran um, I don't know, is there any sort of strategy that's being developed to kind of address 
how to deal with these smaller speedboats where you can't determine the intent of the vessel and oh, sure. what type of like rules do you have in terms of the rules of engagement for uh, really briefly my uh, uh one of my best friends was on the hopper which was one of the ships that you've seen on cnn that was getting harassed by those small boats um I can't speak specifically to programmatic decisions, and there's a fantastic effort going on right now in the Pentagon to decide, based on the strategy, how many ships do we really need and what kinds of ships do we need. Wouldn't it be great if one of those destroyers that was going through the Gulf was surrounded by four small boats, maybe twice the size of those small Iranian boats that were harassing us? It's kind of what we're aiming to do with this. So. The hope is there, the intent is there, and the intellectual power is behind forcing efforts to build ships like that. But I mean, like, are these small boats a real strategic risk, or are they more of just kind of a, a nuisance? Like, I mean, do they do they pose a real threat to? to yes and no. Um, I, I've done it. I've been through the Persian Gulf, and you absolutely cannot tell. I, I have no idea when that small boat that crossed my bow at 50 feet uh, was going to come a little bit closer and blow up, or if he was going to shoot something at me turned out that they were just a couple of guys that were probably drunk and screwing around. You absolutely don't know until it's too late. But the problem we have in the U.S. Navy in that regard is I don't think small boats pose a, a strategic threat to us, but they certainly pose a tactical threat to us. We've paid in the lives of 19 sailors on board the USS Cole that was blown up by a small boat. So we've spilled our blood there. Um, and and we are taking some a whole host of different precautionary measures. Um, we're we're developing, we're adapting some of our high speed Gatling guns that are installed on our ships. They were intended to shoot down missiles and airplanes. They now can attack um, small boats if they need to. Um, we train our crews. If you watch that videotape, I think uh, I was thoroughly impressed with how professional. The captains were of those three Navy ships and the crews that manned them. They, were act, they acted responsibly. They were, they were restrained in their behavior as opposed to the bit Iranian behavior, which I think was provocative and irresponsible. So we're trying to, to demonstrate by our, by our deeds that we are responsible um, professional mariners on the high seas, and small boats can pose a threat to us, as we've seen. And if I could, just real briefly, there's another connection, if you could, uh, to follow up on Evan Morgan's comment, is that uh, a, a tactical action, however that would have unfolded, could have enormous strategic consequences. Um, I mean, you think about if, if something were to happen that would, that would put the, the access, you know, through the Strait of Hormuz to all, to this global system, um, if it would change that dynamic, uh, that the impact it would have on that. Again, uh, resources that are going to countries, not even the United States, that certainly would have a great deal of interest in that and, and how it would potentially pitch us and other you know, countries in the region and around the world into some kind of conflict, either you know, warlike, kinetic, or not kinetic. But again, you know, the things that seem fairly innocuous, other than the fact that it may result in loss of life of the 19 shipments we had on coal, but what, what would happen due to something that's a relatively, you know, uh, seemingly, you know, small tactical decision, but again, would ripple around the world in a matter of minutes and, and potentially have an impact that could last for years. Go ahead, please. Um, I was just wondering, you talked a little bit about having sort of changing the kind of design of the Navy and having some smaller boats guarding the destroyer and kind of changing that up. Uh, my question to you is this. I mean, obviously there's a limit on what we can build in terms of ships. Uh, do you see that the carrier battle group uh, remaining kind of the main face of American extension of power abroad, do you see that continuing? Do you see that changing us, you know, using more smaller ships instead of these gigantic carriers? What? We need now and we will need in the future carrier battle groups. Those aren't going to go away. Those are the extension of American power projection abroad. Um, what we're talking about is, are you familiar with the, the LCS boat? Okay. This is a boat that's intended to operate in, those, in the littoral regions of, uh, of, you know, close to shore, 10 to 12 miles away from shore. Um, it was originally intended to be, I think, a few hundred feet. It, it, I'm not going to get into the cost overruns, et cetera, et cetera. But, but here's what I think, here's where I think it would really be advantageous for the Navy to be going. Let's keep those carrier battle groups, but instead of 50 of those several hundred foot long LCS boats, 
how about a thousand 50 foot long boats with a few machine guns on them you'd be able to put troops uh, ashore in friendly areas that you've already established bases on and again this is conjecture and this is kind of my strategic thinking as someone who is involved with this process um, but does that kind of ring true? Does that make some sense? Would you support something like that? You would? Sir, you're nodding your head. No, why not? I don't think I can do anything with 50-foot ships. I was on a sub chaser for a year and a half in the yes, Second sir. World War. You need a ship. You've got to get your gun plant there, your, your mount there before you can do anything. You've got to have 25 men, 30 men aboard ship before you do anything. A very respectable view, sir, and it's held everywhere. Well, and obviously as a Marine, I would say there's always going to be a, a critical need for amphibious ships because in order to get that power ashore, you need, uh, you need boots on the ground. Sir, I'm kind of confused. I thought the original purpose of the destroyers was to destroy small ships. Aren't there, you know, competing with what the destroyers was the original mission for the destroyer? So... Why do, why do we need to escort destroyers to think that they're right. designed to destroy? Ridiculous. Well, I think, I think you're relating back to in terms of a swarm question that was asked. No, no. He, he suggested that you escort the destroyers. Yeah. Okay. I it's a buttressing argument. And again, like I said, this is a conjecture type of thing, but uh, it in introduced somewhat to, to induce debate, but more so just to point out the fact that I felt – vulnerable when I was going through and I felt vulnerable having the most advanced weapon system on the world vulnerable next to five or six punks on speedboats and that shouldn't be the way the Navy operates and that's the point I'm making but my question is uh, unless you have rules of engagement that say you can't get within so many meters of a ship they can go through an escort and you can't shoot them. and sir that's but that's precisely the rules the rules of engagement you know as you may suspect Get fuzzy. We get into. Do you feel as if you're going to be attacked? Doesn't matter how far he's away. Doesn't matter if he's 200 meters. Doesn't matter if he's 20. So, that's kind of where it gets hazy, and that's why having perhaps having uh, smaller platforms that are more maneuverable, slightly more capable with that surface uh, shooting capability, may help out. Just a thought. Just a thought. But. Um, any more questions? Yes. Uh, would, would those small platforms be launched from a mothership or from the destroyer itself? Well, you know, that, that could vary, sir, because uh, I'll tell you as an example, uh, I was the operations officer on a Coast Guard cutter off the coast of Iraq when we were also harassed by a swarm of uh, vessels coming that happened to be all be Iranian. And my boat was uh, 378 feet, the only boat there with about six Iranian boats at 6.29 in the morning because my alarm was set for 6.30. So uh, how do we respond? We responded within our ROE appropriately, you know, and we were ready and prepared to defend ourselves if necessary. And it was a harassing action. And a lot of that, and that, that may happen. You know, um, did we have small boats available? Yes, we had a small boat available from our ship that we could have sent out to respond to. But as our ship ourselves, we could respond also. So, uh, you know, and there are different countermeasures that ships use. You know, we had surface guns. We had other things like that. But again, um, these actions do happen, and they will continue to happen. And it may not just be Iran. It may be another country. It may be things like that. But as our services, we have to be prepared for differing actions. And we are, we're, we're very well trained for that. You know, that's not something that, uh, as the Admiral mentioned, those sailors responded appropriately, and we did also. So I've been there. And it is scary. <laughs> so not a good way to wake up in the morning. So go ahead. Um, in Iran, uh, is it true that they're not using their own Navy, which is very disciplined, that they've turned it over to this other group? And I've forgotten the name Re of this other group. The what? Revolutionary. The Revolutionary Guard or something. I can't specifically speak totally to the Iranian Navy in that sense. I mean, there are, there's the Iranian Guard Corps Navy. I think that's what you're probably relating to, IRGCN. The wild uh, cowboys in the group, sort of. You know, I, I'm not an Iranian expert, to be honest with you, on that sense. But uh, there are the two factions that do exist like that. We are very concerned that, that the Revolutionary Guard is playing a larger role, perhaps a more influential role, um, with their naval forces. Um, I think Admiral Donegan and Captain Cloyd uh, probably have both deployed to the Persian Gulf recently. And, and my experience is a little bit dated, back four or five years. But, 
But when we deal with the Iranian Navy, they tend to be very professional. They, they, they follow the rules of the game. Um, and we would be worried that um, if their conduct at sea becomes less professional, and that's what was troubling about this event recently, is it seemed more irresponsible, it seemed uh, less disciplined, uh, it seemed provocative, and we don't understand that. Kid, do you have anything else to add? Well, I think that, uh, interesting that you mentioned that. Uh, uh, Al Jazeera was on the ship for about a week or maybe it was five days. Uh, and while they were on the bridge, we had the interaction with an Iranian Navy ship, and it was, uh, uh, it was interesting because at first they didn't even understand what was going on. But uh, basically, uh, as Admiral Morgan said, uh, the, the thing that the thing that comes across loud and clear is this very professional uh, as uh, relationship and interaction between the two navies uh, happens every day. Our, our carriers are only 30 miles off the coast and sometimes from from Iran. And uh, that relationship is very professional. Now when you have the RGCN uh, do this activity uh, in the Straits, uh, completely non-professional, what it threatens is not just the safety of our ships, uh, it's basically a threat to one area where commerce of all the world flows at a tremendous rate. So if they threaten uh, that area, it's one of the few choke points in the world today that there's no alternative path. In other words, the goods that come out of there and flow in and, and through there uh, only have one way out. It will straight to Malacca even, which has tremendous flow of goods. We've done modeling to show that the global system can adjust. Uh, to threaten to close that down, uh, would be a statement uh, that could uh, that basically can hold hold hostage this global system that we talked about. So it is uh, uh, it is troubling to us that we had what we thought was a pretty good relationship, uh, and it shows you about the about navies uh, in the open ocean how even though there can be conflict uh, or not agreement amongst governments, uh, there is a general agreement on the rules of the road and the way you handle yourselves on the open ocean that. Uh, uh, and, and this particular event was not in accordance with any of that. Um, one thing, uh, I know most of this is directly on sea power, but I was just wondering, is, is there any role, role or future role for the Air Force to play in this uh, new strategy of y'all's? No, we hope to put the Air Force out of business. No. <laughs> uh, secondly, I want, I want to touch back on, on China for just one second. Um, if their economic goals are so closely tied with ours, why are they so hesitant to be cooperative as far as uh, military powers go? And okay, first, we, my group and I spent a few hours a couple of weeks ago with a team that's currently writing the Air Force's strategy. And they copied it almost word for word. They took out ships, put in airplanes, so that worked out. It was a smart move on their port, I promise you. No, they're completely revising uh, what they're doing, but we've worked very closely when we were developing our strategy to include uh, a number of Air Force officers to let them know what's going on with us, and uh, they're doing a really good job of letting <clears throat> us know what's going on with them, so there's some good partnership there. Uh, as for China, in the history of the world, no emerging power has risen peacefully. Um, that's what bothers us so much, and, and without going into too much more detail, I think that kind of gets at what you're asking. Uh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. One more. As, just uh, as far as the Air Force, I was went over to their cell. It's called Checkmate, and that's where they're starting to focus all their s strategists for the Air Force. And they're uh, putting out this white paper that's going to um, outline the Air Force's strategy for the way ahead. They're, they did take a lot from our strategy in terms of the global system and how the Air Force can protect the global system. But they did, you know, do a lot of, you know, meat and potatoes, what you'd call the Air Force's missions. And they're, while there's, at the same time, they're trying to branch out to this uh, cross-domain dominance, which, not just air power, but also um, cyberspace. They consider space and cyberspace the Air Force's domain, and that's where they're going to hang their hat. And as we all know, without cyberspace, the global system could take a real nosedive. So they're, the Air Force is, is working, and, and it did come up in our talks that the, Air, the Navy does have considerable air power, as does the Coast Guard and the Marines. So you may see an Air Force strategy with a couple extra crests thrown on it, but not in the immediate future. 
So the three crests you see there on our strategy are, are a real, you know, it's, it really reinforces our, our cooperative nature of our, our maritime forces. And the air forces, you could, you could probably expect that sometime down the road you're going to see a cooperative strategy for the air forces as well. Sir. It would seem that cyberspace could be any services province. Yeah, uh, what, what is, uh, and, and it, that would therefore seem to me to be a political decision. How is this political decision as to allocation of dominance over cyberspace shaping, shaking out as far as the Pentagon's concern and who has dominance and control over that uh, area? Without surrendering my Navy sovereignty, uh, well, John looks like he wants to answer that question first. You know, I, as uh, a non-Pentagon resident, uh, we have our own Coast Guard headquarters not too far away, but I do have a Pentagon badge. Um, yeah, I got that for you last week, didn't thank I? Thank you, thank you. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, um, you know, as far as cyberspace goes, uh, you know, not being a true cyberspace uh, devotee, I guess, uh, but an electrical engineer, uh, you know, the breakdown services do have to break things down within DOD to have someone in charge of different realms. And as was mentioned earlier, obviously space and cyberspace being a major realm, obviously with space, which is a, a pre-component or a primary component of the space side of the Air Force. Um, not really sure where that's going to go in the future. You know, I, I guess if the Air Force is willing to take the ball and lead for that, then it makes perfect sense. But I can say, though, that each service, though, is... is highly concerned about cybersecurity, cyber espionage, all those things. I mean, in the Coast Guard, we just recently became members of the intelligence community, which does not seem like a huge leap for agencies that have already been there, such as the CIA, FBI, et cetera. But what that means is that we're not only able to receive information from those communities, but we're able to actually put information back out there. So what does that mean for us is that our networks and other forms of communication have to be secure for our information to be guaranteed, reliable, to go back out there. So it's a concern for us, and which means larger concerns is someone within our global sphere of the United States has to be the watchdog for that. And it could be potentially an NSA element, and probably already is, um, but uh, someone's not going to tell me, and... Uh, I'm not sure who that person will be because I couldn't tell you anyway. Well, I have a follow-up yes. question, and that is, uh, obviously, each of the services has their own concerns uh, and focus uh, in cyberspace. How is that being coordinated, or is it an effort towards centralizing it, or is it, how is that operating right now? Again, I can't, I, I can't specifically speak to that issue, but I can guarantee you this, though, that as a service, we have numerous concerns and obligations throughout our five services. And we do get together. We all get together on various issues, everything from just transportation logistics to buying parts, et cetera. And so uh, that form, I'm sure, exists where the all services all come together to meet and discuss these issues. Unless there's, Let me, yeah. um, beyond the services, there are joint commanders. And they're either geographical combatant commanders. For instance, we have a Pacific commander and we have a central command commander, but they're also what we call functional commanders. And along the lines of cyberspace, one of our joint functional commanders is our strategic command. And they now understand that with the rise of the information world as it is, is that that information world can pose a threat to us. We in the Pentagon are attacked daily in our computer networks. And so it's the role of our strategic command, because there's such a strategic reliance upon the transfer of information, that they are now, they're coordinating the efforts among all of our services. And so we turned that one joint um, commander to be able to resolve and to be able to apportion and allocate the talents among all the services. A and that commander reports directly to the Secretary of Defense. Um, so. You may see different uniforms here representing different services, but then we have this joint command structure that tries to integrate and co collate um, all those different functions. So in cyberspace, we're doing that with our strategic commander. Uh, does, does, does that in particular, uh, could it relate to our 
the situation with China, given as they've apparently been pretty heavy in the cyber attacks, and they also seem to want to be able to shoot down satellites? Yeah, we're certainly seeing, I mean, the development a year ago, January, when the, ja when the Chinese shot down one of their own weather satellites. Was, and, and what that really signified was probably the end of about two decades of restraint um, with weaponizing space. Now, the Chinese may have done that to send a signal to us. Uh, we, we, we can't divine all their intentions. Um, but certainly China has a very talented engineering corps, uh, a cadre of people, both military and civilian, and, and certainly they're flexing their muscles in the information world as well. So um, not only do we, do we look at things in terms of this joint structure where all the services get together, but then we look at it in terms of across the U.S. government because the U.S. Treasury is being attacked and they're not in the Department of Defense. And, and so we're, we're now trying to integrate this across what we call the interagency, State Department, Defense, Treasury, Commerce. Um, so it's, it's a significant challenge. And it's not only the Chinese government. I mean, individual hackers, um, terrorist groups, uh, teenagers. Um, so it, it's a very complex uh, issue that, that we're trying to wrestle with. No clear answers. Yes, uh, Captain. With the uh, focus on the humanitarian efforts, how is that going to change the Marine response units? I know uh, the Marines have guys out in the fleet right now that are designed for that. Are those numbers going to increase? Are you going to pull boots off the ground to be able to respond to humanitarian efforts more? Or how is that going to change the Marine structure? Well. One of the things that, as Marines, we like to say that uh, we're skilled in many different uh, different uh, areas, and one of our concepts that we're working on working on currently is called the strategic corporal. And what that basically involves is saying you have a a young leader, a a, a corporal could be a lance corporal, sergeant, whatever, but a young leader that is trained to not only go out there and fight, but also at a moment's notice maybe, and we've seen this in Iraq and other places as well, where they transition from fighting to more of a humanitarian, to uh, helping to build infrastructure. And what we're looking to do is to uh, increase the training for uh, young Marines, uh, as well as officers, staff, NCOs, what have you, that they'd be able to make that tr transition quickly, be able to do multi-missions from combat to the humanitarian. So it's not that you're necessarily pulling them away from the battle necessarily, but they're able, once the bullets stop flying, they're able to help people get the, the help they need. Folks, if there are any sort of alibi type questions, I think we've neared the end of, uh, of, uh, of our time today. We really appreciate it. Uh, we'd like to ask your indulgence in showing you a quick video uh, before you take off and hope you enjoy it.
So once again, thank you very much. If you filled out critique sheets, please drop them on the desk. Thank you so much for coming, and the strategies are yours.